All right, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 44th Annual Engineers Week celebration at South Dakota Mines. Uh, my name is Jade Herman. I'm the Director of Planning and Events in the Office of the President here at Mines. Um, normally, we would be hosting hundreds of middle school and high school students on campus today for Engineering and Science Day campus tours and department presentations. Um, although we can't host that event in person this year, we're very excited for this special virtual event in partnership with the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Um, in just a minute, we're going to be joined live by astrophysicist Mark Hanhart, who is an experimental support scientist at Sanford Lab. Right now, Mark is 4,850 feet below ground on the Ross campus of Sanford Lab, Sanford Lab in the CASPAR experiment. Um, participants on this call can ask questions via the Q&A box below if you're joining us on Zoom or in the chat boxes if you're joining us on Facebook. Um, we'll get to the questions at the end of Mark's tour. So um, take it away, Mark. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, as she said, uh, my name is Mark Honhart, and I'm coming to you from nearly a mile underground uh, here at the Casper Lab at the Ross campus of uh, the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And I'm really excited that I get to show off uh, where I work every day to you. Um, so uh, first of all, this is the control room, and we'll uh, uh, take a look at it uh, as we walk around here. But before we head in and actually see the accelerator and talk about all the shiny bits, all the cool science stuff, um, I want to discuss real quick what we do here at Casper. Oh, it's not tracking music. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> um, I want to talk about what we're actually doing uh, here. Uh, Casper is a project in a field that we call nuclear astrophysics. And that's basically us trying to understand how the stars burn and how they create new elements, how they do what they do. You guys may know that a, a star is basically a giant ball of gas that's really, really hot in the center. And when it's hot uh, in, a, in the center of a ball of gas, that means the atoms that make up that gas are flying around at incredible speeds, and sometimes they run into each other. And what we study here at Casper is what happens when those particles run into each other. Sometimes those particles may just bounce off of each other and not do much. Sometimes they pass right through each other, which is something that seems you know, counterintuitive because that doesn't happen in our everyday world. Uh, but in nuclear physics, that does happen. And occasionally, sometimes those particles will come together just right and with just enough energy that they will undergo what we call nuclear fusion. And they will create this giant burst of energy and they'll release particles and they'll release light and they create new elements. And at CASPER, we're interested in answering the questions about how that happens. You know, what if we take two different particles, we take a, a hydrogen atom and a helium atom and we smash them together? Or what happens when we take a, a helium atom and a lithium atom or boron or magnesium or, you know, lithium? There's a bunch of other uh, atoms that we can work with and, and we try to understand how these interactions take place. And we also want to understand questions like, what if those particles are going slightly faster or slightly slower? And what's going on when those particles pass through each other? Is, the way, is there a way we can predict that? Is there a way we can try to understand that? And to answer all of those questions, we've built Casper here nearly a mile underground uh, with the goal of basically smashing a lot of particles together and recreating the conditions inside the heart of a star so that we can try to answer those questions. Now, uh, we can't move on from the uh, control room without me pointing out this. This is what we call the chart of nuclides, and that's what we use to study these particles. You guys have probably seen the periodic table of elements that chemists use. Well, this is what physicists use in uh, nuclear physics because uh, we're cooler than chemists, frankly. Uh, that's, I'm just kidding, of course. I have a lot of friends who are chemists, uh, and I'm cooler than all of them. It's worth mentioning. Uh, but this is what we use to study all of these different elements that we can work with inside of our accelerator and what they create. Now, uh, we're about to head into the accelerator hall, which is where the Casper accelerator is actually located. But before we do, it's worth pointing out the control room. And we're actually going to come back here so that I can explain some of this stuff here at the end and answer some of your questions. Uh, oh, and by the way, if you have questions uh, about something I'm showing at the time, please let me know, and I'll stop and try to answer that as best I can. Uh, but this is the control room where we actually run the accelerator. And before we head in, a quick word about radiation. The type of accelerator we're running does generate a really small amount of radiation. It's a, 
an amount that doesn't uh, pose any threat to humans, but we take safety very seriously anytime we're working with any type of radiation. So everyone who works on Casper wears one of these. It's called a radiation badge. And this tracks the amount of radiation that I get over the course of say three or four months. Uh, it's always come back with uh, essentially zero radiation, so I don't pick up very much. But if ever something happens where I do pick something up, we wanna know about it. We also have uh, radiation monitors uh, all throughout the lab. And you may see some when we go inside the accelerator lab. We have these uh, round spheres here and these uh, uh, tan looking cylinders, and those look for gamma rays and neutron radiation, which are the types of radiation that we can generate with this uh, accelerator and the types of radiation that we wanna be careful about. And on top of that, we also had the accelerator stored behind this, which is a 5,000 pound, three inch thick lead door. It's so heavy that we actually have to have a motor open up the door because you couldn't do it very easily by yourself. This is the most James Bond part of my day, when I get to open up the slow door, letting me into my evil lab. I really like this part of my day. Uh, and now we can walk in and actually take a look at the accelerator itself. Now you're about to see a lot of really complicated equipment and a lot of, uh, you know, very accurate, very specific uh, pieces of science equipment. But I want you to remember that the whole goal of this accelerator is pretty simple. Our entire goal is to take one particle and shoot it really fast at another particle so that when they collide, we can see that nuclear reaction or whatever happens when those two particles collide and understand what happens inside the heart of a star. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'm gonna run through how we achieve just accelerating these particles with this machine. This right here, this big black tank, is actually what we would call the accelerator itself. This is the part that actually shoots the particles out of it. And if you take a look at this picture uh, that is on the tank, you can see what it looks like inside of the black tank. This is all the parts that actually work. And if it looks kind of like a, uh, 1960s sci-fi movie death ray, that's because that's basically what it is. It's a device that generates a stream of particles uh, that it shoots out through the rest of our beamline, which we'll walk through here in a second. And it's a really cool device that, uh, unfortunately it has to be inside this tank to work. But when it's not, it's neat because there's a million volts of electricity running through this thing, sometimes sparking all over the place. Uh, and there's a little ball, I'm sorry, a little bottle of gas that sits down there from which we pull our particles that uh, we turn into a plasma, which is this glowing purple gas that's charged with electric energy. And it's really cool to see that running, but uh, unfortunately it won't work properly until we put the tank on it and then we can't see it. Uh, so basically what this does is it generates a really big, what we call electrostatic field. If you guys have ever gone to a, a fair and seen uh, one of those Van de Graaff generators is what they call them. It's a big column with a, a, you know, a chrome looking sphere on top. And you put your hand on it, your hair goes everywhere. That's a Van de Graaff generator. And this is basically just one of those. It builds up that big static electricity, right? And uh, all we do is we uh, put one of our electrically charged particles that we want to shoot right next to that, uh, that charged Van de Graaff generator and the static electricity just pushes the particle away. It's not really more complicated than that. It pushes it down the beam line, which we'll now take a look at. Now the beam line itself is mostly uh, comprised of this stainless steel tube. Inside of that tube, the particles that we created down here, or rather that we accelerated, that we shot out of the accelerator itself, come running down this beam line. Now, in order to make sure that those particles don't run into molecules of air or something else, we evacuate this tube. That means we put a bunch of vacuum tubes on it and pull all the air out. So this is basically like the vacuum of space in here. Maybe not quite so, uh, quite so hard a vacuum, but it's still uh, uh, very, very evacuated in there. And in order to make sure that the particles don't run into the sides, you know, they don't... Uh, uh, get off uh, aim and they stay right in the center of that beam line, we have these giant magnets placed throughout. 
these magnets create giant magnetic fields that allow the particles to stay right in the center of that beam line and go exactly where we need them to make sure that we're not losing them in the sides of the, uh, uh, the beam line here. Uh, so these giant magnets create incredibly strong magnetic fields in order to keep those things contained. Uh, we also have uh, a set of uh, other magnets that are actually on the other side, but uh, I'll point them out uh, as we head back, uh, that uh, they don't just keep the particles contained within that beam line, they also help them steer up and down and left and right to make sure that we're hitting the target at the end, which we'll get to in a minute. We have another giant magnet uh, about halfway down the beam line where the beam line actually takes a 25 degree turn. And this entire uh, uh, magnet system is designed just to filter out particles. We generate a giant magnetic field here and the particles that go through it, uh, there's a lot of particles that we accidentally accelerate along with the particles we want at the accelerator end and only the ones we want make it through the exact 25 degree turn. If there's a particle that's too heavy, it doesn't quite make the turn. If it's too light, it turns too much and it ends up not making exactly 25 degrees. Uh, and so it doesn't go down the rest of the beam line. It's basically what we call a filtering system. It gets rid of the particles we don't want and keeps the particles we do want. And then further down the beam line, this is all pretty much a repeat of the section we just saw. You can see these are what we call the steering magnets I talked about. Those are the ones that steer up and down and left and right. And then this is, even though this looks slightly different than the other magnets we had, it serves the same purpose. Uh, this is the one that keeps everything tight and inside the beam line, making sure it's uh, aimed uh, right through the center. And now if we come down to the end uh, of the beam line, you're gonna see this is a very complicated system. Uh, it's what we call a gas target system. So we're shooting particles down the beam line and we're aiming them at particles that are at this end of the beam line. Again, our whole goal is just to make that collision. We wanna see what type of nuclear reactions, uh, reactions take place when those particles hit each other. So this is where we have the target system. And there are a lot of different target systems that uh, we've used. This is the one we're using for our current experiments. Uh, and what we do is basically, <laughs> We pump a lot of neon gas, which is our current target, neon atoms, uh, into this system right here. Then as the particles come down the beam line, they hit the gas uh, molecule, I'm sorry, the gas atoms uh, inside the system and they actually undergo that reaction. And where the magic actually takes place is hidden by this purple cube. That purple cube is a type of plastic that we just call poly. And that poly is really good at containing neutron radiation, because when the reaction between the particles we're shooting and the neon gas happens, it creates a lot of neutron radiation. The shielding, this uh, poly, isn't actually here to protect us. It's here to capture the neutrons so that they can be picked up by detectors that are buried inside of this cube. And those detectors pick up the neutrons and tell us exactly what happened inside of this uh, reaction. And that's really the data we're looking for. And the better we can collect that data, the better we can understand what happened inside the accelerator. And then everything around this is designed basically just for making that neon flow through the system and pull it out and maintain a vacuum inside the beam line. Um, and then if we wanna come just a little bit further along to the very end, You can see that uh, we're now looking directly down the path of the beam line. And if you wanna take a look at this device right here, this helps us make sure that when we're setting things up, our beam line is as straight as it can possibly be. And that way we can make sure that the, the particles that we're accelerating have the maximum chance of actually hitting the particles of gas that we've got set up in the end of the chamber here. And then you can also see there's a lot of uh, equipment that it takes to make all of this stuff run. We have a, a lot of readouts. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, what we call data acquisition systems, which are largely uh, bare bones computers to help us understand the data that uh, is coming out of the uh, detectors. We even have right here, uh, what looks like 
a sodium iodide detector, which is designed specifically to look for gamma rays that come out of uh, uh, the reactions that we're creating. Right now, uh, the reactions we're running, we're mostly concerned with the neutron radiation, but the, we do get some useful information from the gamma rays as well. Um, and that's basically, that's, that's the Casper accelerator in a nutshell. There's a lot of complicated parts and it can be difficult to make the thing uh, work all in harmony so that we can get the exact results we're looking for. But at its core, this entire thing is basically a particle gun with a particle target attached to the other end. We shoot particles that hit particles, and when they, uh, when they meet, they undergo some sort of nuclear reaction, and we use the detectors uh, all around it to study what that reaction is. Um, I think that's it for the, the accelerator itself. If you take a look uh, behind you, you can see we actually have more of these radiation counters. They help us understand uh, the type of radiation that may be generated in the area of the actual target, uh, just to make sure that we're not producing anything that's dangerous for humans to be around. Uh, and that is, that is Casper. Uh, if we can, we'll head back into the control room and I'll show you what it looks like to actually run this thing. Oh, and I suppose it's worth taking a second to point out all of the equipment that we have down here. Because when you're a mile underground, uh, you can't just pop off to the hardware store to find a piece to replace something that may have broken. Uh, so we have all the parts we need down here to usually make new stuff for the accelerator. Uh, that uh, not only saves us a trip to the surface, but also with experiments like this that no one has ever done before, it's not like someone makes parts that you can just buy to plug in. So a lot of times we have to actually make what it is we're working on. Um, all right, so that's the workbench area. <laughs> And now we're back in the control room where we can talk a little clear, uh, more clearly. This is the system that we actually use to control that. When we have the accelerator running, we're not allowed inside because again, it generates very, very little radiation, but we wanna be as safe as possible, so we stay in here. And we have a control for every piece of equipment that's running inside of the accelerator hall. Well, almost every piece. Um, when I'm running the accelerator, what I need to do, I'm gonna take a seat here. What I need to do is keep an eye on this set of controls, which actually control the accelerator itself. It, it controls the amount of gas that I'm letting into the accelerator, which is the source of the particles that we're shooting. It controls how the plasma, which is created in that bottle, that purple glowing plasma I talked about, uh, is created and it, uh, it dictates how strong the electrostatic field is that shoots those particles down through the beam line. I also have to keep my eye on this, which helps me understand the energy, or rather the speed at which the particles are traveling down that beam line. I have to keep an eye on all of these gauges, which are the gas pressure or the vacuum uh, pressure, if you will, of the beam line to make sure that those are all within the parameters that we set. I have to keep my eye on every single one of the magnets that is inside that system. And on top of that, I have to keep my eye on the amount of particles that are going through each and every section of that beam line, uh, as well as several spots along the beam line uh, to make sure that everything's all right. Um, this is part of the target system that helps me understand if I'm on target and how much of the beam I have going to the target, how much I'm actually hitting that target the way I want to. And then uh, I have my radiation monitors over here. And then these systems uh, are uh, basically how I'm steering that beam line through the, I'm sorry, that uh, particle beam through the beam line to make sure that I'm hitting everything I need to, that it's going around the magnet the way it needs to, and that the current, uh, the electric current inside of the accelerator and at the target 
are all working properly. Uh, when I'm actually running this thing, uh, it takes all of my attention because I have to keep my eye simultaneously on all four of these things at once. So we usually run in teams of two because I then also need someone to run this system over here, uh, which is largely related with the target uh, and a system that's not currently up on this computer, but would be if we were running to actually monitor what's coming through that neutron detector uh, stream at the end. So it's a very complicated process. And I know that's a weird thing to say that nuclear physics is complex, but it is uh, in this case. Most of, the, uh, most of the goals that we have are pretty simple. Again, we're basically just shooting one particle at another particle to see what happens, but making that happen is a, a pretty complex subject. Um, so that's, uh, that's Casper in a nutshell. That's how we actually make this run. And that's uh, what we're looking for. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have now. Um, but I'm also happy to talk uh, more in depth about what it is we're looking for with Casper. Um, and I, I suppose I'll do that until we have some questions that come up. Oh, there are lots of questions already. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, then why don't we jump into those right away? And uh, maybe I can get into the, uh, the deep physics here in a second. Oh, yeah, we can absolutely go back in there if we need to. I'm going to test out my audio. Is that okay? Yep, we can hear you just fine, Erin. Okay, great. So the first question is an easy one. Ghostbusters or Mythbusters? Oh, man, that's not an easy one. Uh, <laughs> oh, I mean, you know, uh, the Ghostbusters are fantastic. They're, they're scientists with proton packs. And I, I wear a Ghostbusters patch uh, on the coveralls that I have to wear underground. But uh, uh, Mythbusters, hands down, those guys are, are real scientists. They, they blow stuff up and they record it. And that is the heart of science. That's basically what we're trying to do here at Casper is blow stuff up by running particles into each other and recording it. So Mythbusters, sorry. I'm sorry to you, Ghostbusters. I have to say Mythbusters. <laughs> that wasn't an easy question. I feel like that tore up part of my soul. <laughs> All right. Well, here's another one. Is there a specific particle the accelerator uses? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Yes. Uh, there are a lot of different types of accelerators in the world, and each one kind of specializes in one or two different particles. The particles that we're interested in the most are the ones that are the most abundant in stars, and that is hydrogen and helium. But we don't actually shoot the whole atom down an accelerator because uh, that's not actually the form that those gases uh, take form of uh, inside of a star. Uh, so we actually just suit the nucleus of those two atoms. And the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is just a proton. And the nucleus of a helium atom is uh, what we just call an alpha particle. It's two uh, protons and two neutrons coupled together. Uh, so those are the particles that we specialize in here. Uh, so when we, uh, when we have to generate those particles inside the accelerator, we just let in a little hydrogen gas, or we just let in a little helium gas from the little tank we have, and then we, we bombard it with this really strong electromagnetic radio frequency that basically strips off the electrons and turns them into the nuclei, into the particles that we need. So yes, we do specialize. Those are the two particles we use, protons and alpha particles. That's a great question. Another question from Facebook is, with all of the equipment running and the heat of being underground, is it pretty warm down there? Ooh, uh, sometimes it can be. Uh, it turns out that the equipment uh, certainly does get hot. And we have a lot of water cooling systems that actually cool down the magnets in particular. And when we're using not the gas target that I showed you, but when we're using something called a solid target, we have water circulating on that to keep it cool. Uh, but for us personally, it's usually pretty, uh, pretty nice down here, about uh, uh, 72 degrees, uh, because we have a really good air handling system that was set up specifically to make humans really comfortable underground. Uh, so actually, it's, it's usually pretty nice down here. How long is the particle accelerator in feet? Ooh, uh, in feet. I think it's approximately 50 to 60 feet long. I think it's 50 feet long, yeah. Um, you know, we don't, uh, we don't often measure stuff in feet uh, in science. It's, uh, it's usually meters. So if you were to ask me what it was in meters, I couldn't tell you that either because I'm not familiar with it. 
<laughs> we're not uh, we're not usually concerned with the uh, uh, the length of the accelerator. What we're concerned with is the energy of the particles we can put down it. Uh, so it's weird when you get into physics, you stop measuring the stuff that you know would make common sense to measure, like the length of an accelerator. We measure it in the amount of energy we can generate, and that makes things weird for us because it, it, we sometimes can't answer the really easy questions. Uh, but this one, fortunately, I looked up recently. It's it's about 50 feet long. Great. Is the Caspar project just at Sanford Lab, or are there other labs out there doing work on it as well? Ooh, also a good question. Uh, the main work for Caspar is definitely done down here. This is where we do all the reaction work. Uh, there's some work that supports us, that helps us actually do this work properly, uh, that takes place mostly at uh, the University of Notre Dame's Nuclear Science Lab. Uh, and that's where we get a lot of the target systems, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of the targets themselves, rather, and definitely a lot of the expertise that allows us to run this accelerator. And the gas target system that I showed you was actually developed by uh, one of our collaborators working at the Colorado School of Mines. And then we also have work being done at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, uh, where we prepare uh, these systems to, to run. But all of the actual data collection, all the stuff that we're actually going to crunch mathematically, that's done down here. Another great question is, how does this compare to the LHC? And maybe for those who don't know what the LHC is, talk about that a bit. Okay, this is, I love this question because uh, it, it demonstrates exactly the niche that Casper is fulfilling. So the LHC that someone is asking about, asking about, that's the Large Hadron Collider. It's this giant accelerator system in, what is it, the border of Switzerland and France? I think that's right. Uh, Matt says yes. Uh, uh, it's this giant accelerator that's able to reach uh, what we call uh, tetra electron volt energies, which is incredibly large energies uh, for particles. Uh, and it's this uh, it's this accelerator system that's uh, more than twenty miles in diameter. It's a very very big, very expensive, very energetic accelerator uh, that's built specifically for getting particles to the highest speed, the highest energy that they can get them. Casper is the very other end of the spectrum. Our entire goal in coming underground, in developing the particular type of accelerator we have, is to get the lowest, <laughs> uh, to get the lowest energy we possibly can. Uh, our goal is to recreate the energies that you would actually experience inside the heart of a star. And even, so the, uh, even though the inside of a star is well, roughly 10 million degrees Celsius, it's you know, very, very hot compared to you know, the 72 degrees that it is down here. Uh, as far as the universe is concerned, 10 million degrees isn't a lot of energy. Uh, so we actually have to produce the lowest energy particle beam that we can, whereas the LHC is not interested in reproducing the conditions inside the heart of a star. They're interested in producing the, the, uh, the conditions that are happening inside the heart of a supernova explosion or inside the heart of the Big Bang itself, the event that created the entire universe. And they have to go incredibly high in energy. But our whole goal is to go incredibly, incredibly low in energy. And so we're totally different ends of the spectrum. Also, our scientists are handsomer. Is that, is that a good answer? It I was, but then right know. away the camera <laughs> flew away. So I'm so handsome, the camera good. can't handle me. <laughs> uh, another great question. How long does it take to get from the surface to Caspar? Oh, um, all right. So uh, we're 4,850 feet below the surface. And uh, the ride on the cage, which is what we call the elevator that, that brings us down that, that distance, uh, takes about 12 and a half minutes, sometimes about 13 minutes to travel all the way from the surface to down here. And then it's about a mile walk from where the cage lets us off to over here. Uh, so depending on who you're walking with, it could be a five minute walk. Or if you're walking with me, it's about 15 or 20 minutes. <laughs> awesome. Do different particles require different methods of acceleration? Ooh, uh, yes, absolutely they do. Uh, fortunately, because we restrict ourselves to only alpha particles and protons, 
which are both accelerated in much the same way, we can get away with only having one method of acceleration in Casper. Um, but other accelerators that accelerate other types of particles, they do have to use different systems. Um, and some of them are quite complicated. I, I, like I mentioned to you guys, ours is pretty simple. We create this electrostatic field, which is basically just you know static electricity, the stuff you feel uh, in your hair uh, when you rub your socks on the carpet or something like that. Uh, so it's, it's pretty simple, but some of the other systems are extremely complicated, including, you know, uh, uh, rotational, I'm sorry, not rotational, but uh, uh, rather circular magnet systems that switch on and off at super fast frequencies and uh, stuff I don't even want to get into. So we're, we're fortunate that we get to run a pretty simple accelerator for the types of things we're actually interested in with Casper. This one is kind of related. How often does the particle accelerator shoot particles? Every few minutes, seconds, milliseconds? Ooh, that's a good question too, because uh, it can get, it can be easy to lose a sense of scale when you're working on stuff like this. When we're shooting particles out of the accelerator down the beam line, it depends of course on, on a couple of parameters that I have to set with this, the type of experiment that we're doing, but typically we're shooting millions of particles every second. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of particles in that beam that actually shoots out uh, and hits the target. Um, and depending on the target we're using and the energy that we're at, uh, we may actually end up uh, uh, generating a million reactions uh, a second. Or sometimes it may be one reaction every couple of hours. Even if we're shooting a million particles every second, uh, some of the reactions are are so difficult to achieve, they have what we call a low cross section. They're so difficult to achieve that they may only happen once or twice in an hour, or I'm sorry, once every uh, every other hour. And those are those are really long shifts when you have to wait for each little reaction to come in. <laughs> yeah. So you talked earlier about the the bend in the accelerator and how that helps you focus the beam line, the type of particles that you want to be traveling through. If you're accelerating different particles, would the angle of the bend be different? Yes, it absolutely would be. And that's a really thoughtful question. That's a, that's a deep physics question. Um, so uh, the quick version is this. We generate a magnetic field in that particular section of the beam line where that bend is happening. And one of the fundamental uh, rules of physics is that how much something will bend <laughs> like the camera, how much something will bend as it goes through a magnetic field depends on two things. One, its momentum, which is basically its speed and its mass multiplied by each other, uh, and the electric charge that's on it. Uh, so a particle that has too much mass, it won't bend enough. It won't bend 25 degrees. It'll bend like two degrees, or it'll bend 10 degrees, or something like that, and it'll end up running into something that stops it rather than going down the beam line. Or if a particle is too light, it'll actually bend too much. Or conversely, if we have something that has too much charge, too strong a charge, it will also bend too sharply. Whereas if it doesn't have enough charge, it won't bend enough. So the only particles that make the exact 25 degree turn that will allow it to go down the rest of the beam line are the ones that have the exact momentum and charge of the ones we want. And that's really handy because we can't just shotgun particles at our target and hope for the best. We have to make sure that we're running exactly the particles that we want into that target in order for the nuclear physics to make sense as it comes out the other end. That's a fantastic question. That's, that's deep physics right there. So how often are different tests carried out and how long would they last? Ooh, that's also a, that's one of those questions that's difficult to answer. There are there are experiments that last only a couple of days um, with us running you know, 24 hours a day, uh, uh, people coming down for 12 hour shifts at a time, uh, trying to collect all the data. And then there are experiments that you would have to run for months in order to gather enough uh, uh, data. And that's largely dependent on what I was talking about before, how sometimes we have reactions that happen a thousand times a second. You can get a, a, an experiment like that done pretty quick. But if there's an experiment where you need to collect one data point every two hours, you could be down here a while trying to get enough data to actually make sense. Uh, so they can, 
they can run pretty often, or uh, I'm sorry, they can run pretty long. Uh, as far as how often we switch, uh, basically as soon as we're done with one and we've taken a little break to give the, the crew a rest from all these 24 hour shifts, we're right back at it. So we try to have as little downtime as possible so that we're making sure we're making good use of the time we've got. Here's another deep physics question for you. <laughs> and this comes in two parts. Okay. The first is, are there neutrinos produced in those reactions? And are the particles that are produced in this experiment, can they be detected by nearby detectors also on the 4850 level of Sanford lab? Ooh, that is a good question. Okay, so uh, the first part of your question, yes. Uh, neutrinos are produced in some of the reactions uh, that, that we do here. Um, it's worth mentioning that it's an incredibly small amount compared to the neutrino background. Uh, so if you were to hold up your hand, for instance, no matter where you are on the surface underground, if you were on Mars, uh, if you held out your hand, every square centimeter of your skin would have 65 billion neutrinos passing through it every second, just from the sun alone, just from the reactions that are happening inside the sun. Uh, and there are a lot of other sources of neutrinos. The sun's certainly the biggest one though. So 65 billion for every square centimeter for every second. Uh, so whatever neutrinos are actually created in Casper when we do our reactions are totally lost in that background. If we had something that was detecting every single neutrino, which is not something we can actually build. That's not a, that's not a, a realistic detector type. But if we had this, you know, uh, imaginary detector that detected every neutrino, we still would have difficulty figuring out which ones came from Casper amongst all the ones that are coming from the sun. So we do create neutrinos, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not a problem for anyone. As far as the other particles that we create, uh, they are not picked up by anything, uh, any of the other detectors here on the 4850, unless by some incredible random chance, one of them uh, avoided uh, every bit of mass between here and uh, the Davis campus where the other detectors are and got picked up. But the fact is most of the particles or the radiation that's created by Casper is stopped within that purple cube. And that very little that's not is stopped by the first, I'd say centimeter of rock of the, uh, uh, the uh, tavern around us. Uh, so uh, the, the thing is we're generating incredibly low energy particles and they don't travel very far. So uh, yeah, there's, there's basically no way that uh, a particle would be picked up by any other detector here on the 4850. Even if they were in the control room with us, probably wouldn't pick up any of them. Right, and for this next question, I feel like anyone who knows you knows that the answer is yes. Uh, but they ask, do you get inspiration from the laser beams in Bond movies? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. No, that's fair. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, <laughs> the camera is... No, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, yes, but maybe not the way you think. I'm definitely more inspired by the supervillain side of the Bond films. That's definitely what I'm going for, especially here in my evil lair a mile underground. Uh, I, I definitely aspire to one day, you know, have Bond in my clutches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any of them, I'll, I'll, I'll handle any of them. <laughs> I'm not picky. All right, is the work being done at Caspar used to investigate the possibility of nuclear fusion as a viable power source instead of fossil fuels? Ooh. Uh, so the, the first order approximation answer here is no. We're not doing anything that directly relates to that. Uh, but this is one of the cool things about working in physics and for me in particular nuclear physics, um, which is that every bit of knowledge that we add to the you know, scientific library of knowledge uh, helps every other little bit of nuclear physics. So we're not doing anything that's directly related to that, but every bit we add to the, you know, nuclear physics database uh, helps us understand the stuff that would make nuclear fusion one day a viable option. Um, in a very, very small amount, of course, 
But yeah, uh, ultimately the work we're doing can help us understand that entire nuclear landscape. It's important for us to understand to make that possible. And again, that's one of the neatest things about working in, in basically any science because the stuff we're doing could end up helping a technology or a field so completely removed from what we're actually working on that it you know, boggles the mind. Uh, a good example is uh, one of the reasons that uh, Wi-Fi works, the whole idea behind wireless uh, internet uh, is because of a series of mathematical equations that came out of people studying black holes. They had no idea that was gonna come in handy for you know, developing Wi-Fi technology, but here we are. That's, it's a neat thing being involved in physics where you just can't see where that stuff's going. Awesome. All right. Another question is how high energy is the radiation produced? Ooh, uh, incredibly low. <laughs> uh, we measure things in energy units of electron volts, uh, which is an incredibly small amount uh, of uh, energy. And uh, so for instance, um, trying to come up with a good uh, comparison. I'm trying to think of uh, the energy of particles that stream out of the sun and come down as cosmic rays on us. Uh, those are in the, the mega or even giga electron volt range. So that's a million to a billion electron volts. Whereas the stuff we're working on down here is usually a couple hundred thousand electron volts. It's, uh, it's so incredibly low energy that the whole reason we're underground is because it's too noisy on the surface. There's, there's too many other high energy sources of radiation that we'd never be able to detect our radiation if we were on the surface. It'd be lost in this, this wash of, of what we call you know, radioactive noise, this, this stuff coming from the sun and cell phone towers and radio towers. And even people put off more radiation than some of our experiments do. So uh, incredibly, incredibly low. And how many people work on the Caspar experiment? Uh, about half of them, I'd say. <laughs> Is that a good no, answer? That's such an old dad joke. Uh, we have about a dozen people who work specifically on the Caspar stuff. Uh, during any one given campaign, which is what we call the, uh, uh, the experiments, the, the individual experiments that we're working on, we usually have uh, six to seven people uh, assigned to a campaign and they'll rotate out those 24 hour shifts. But all in all, we have about 12 people who are part of the Casper collaboration that come together to make their ideas work and, and come up with the experiments. Great. Does Sanford Lab work with CERN? And maybe you can do a brief uh, explanation of what CERN is. Not a full explanation, but. You know. uh, sure, uh, so CERN is the, it's this collaborative science group uh, based in Europe, basically. They're the ones who run LHC. They also run a lot of other uh, 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 physics and other science uh, experiments. Um, they're, they're really this uh, multinational, well, worldwide, basically. Um, organization that's based in Europe that runs all of these experiments. Uh, we, we work with a lot of the same scientists. Uh, I can't tell you if there's any, any collaboration between the two organizations at, a, at an organizational scale. Uh, if there is, I'm not involved in it too much, but there are a lot of experiments where we share scientists. Uh, I, I've personally worked with several scientists who, uh, uh, who designed or ran systems on the LHC at CERN. And it's uh, interesting to see scientists who weave their way in and out of different organizations and then end up at, you know, uh, SURF uh, or, or CERN or other labs. Uh, so certainly uh, in that sense, uh, we basically work with every lab because uh, we work with the same scientists. But if there's some sort of organizational collaboration, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it or a part of it. But really, uh, one of the cool things, again, about working in science is um, it, it is definitely a competitive thing, but everyone still works together to achieve the same goals. So we, we don't collaborate directly with CERN, uh, but we do do complementary experiments. They do the stuff that we can't do here, and we do the stuff that they can't do there so that we can all put together the clearest picture of the universe uh, that we can. 
Do you work exclusively on Caspar or are you involved in other projects at Sanford Lab? Oh, uh, I work uh, primarily on Casper, but uh, I, I work on a lot of other stuff. Uh, I'm not um, working as a scientist on any of the other experiments. There are other experiments where I work as a technician. You know, I'll help with uh, some systems uh, if they're breaking down or they just need an extra hand. Uh, and I'm certainly uh, uh, involved in manual labor. Uh, for some of the experiments, you know, they need something moved somewhere and I'm a, a big strong guy. So uh, I have no problem doing that. Um, but as far as the science level is concerned, as far as contributing to collecting data and, and actually doing the analysis and, and running the actual experiment, Casper uh, is the one I'm uh, the only one I'm involved with. But my time is split with the other experiments, just trying to make sure that they're, they've got what they need to run smoothly. Great, so we have time for two more questions. Oh, wow. And one, I'm going to ask you to just go back to the bare bones of what Caspar is looking for. Remind us after we've talked about all of these details, what is the point of Caspar? All right. I'm going to try to make this the quick version since we have so little time. But this is, this is really what I want to touch on because this is what makes me so excited to work on Caspar. The universe is filled with interesting features. Um, that are largely created out of elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium, you know, stars and supernovas and planets and you and me. And understanding how the universe came up with all of these elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium is really interesting to me to, to try to understand. Because in a very real sense, the atoms, the, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the carbon that make up your body, that make up my body, those were born inside the heart of a star. Those actually came from the, the thermonuclear furnace inside of a star that exploded and spread those atoms out into space where they could one day coalesce into Earth and then eventually us. And the idea of using this accelerator to create these tiny reactions as they would take place inside the heart of a star to then create elements heavier than hydrogen and helium is poetry to me. The idea that I can use this machine to peek behind the curtain of the universe and understand where we come from in a very literal sense, our chemical lineage is what I've heard it called, uh, is extremely exciting to me. Uh, so Casper's goal is basically to understand how the stars burn and how they created the elements that make the universe the incredibly interesting place that it is. Uh, so uh, Casper at its nutshell is that. It's an exploration of, you know, where we're from and in a larger sense where we're going because everything we discover helps us understand how the universe got to where it is and model where the universe is going, how late stars can form, uh, how early life could have formed in the universe. Are we you know, the first ones here, are we alone? Or have we been around long enough that other civilizations could have been built out of the elements that, that formed earlier in the universe? There's a lot of deep questions that you can answer, but you have to start here. You have to understand the nuclear astrophysics of the universe before you can actually, uh, before you can tackle those questions. So um, perhaps that's waxing a, a bit too poetic, but that's, uh, for me, that's the drive for why I like working with Casper. Right, and to take that one step further, what's the most surprising or fascinating thing you've learned so far from your work there? Ooh, um, there's so much stuff. Uh, this is an experiment where we, um, uh, we're not usually doing you know, big discoveries. We're not finding something that drastically changes the universe. What we're doing is building up the the foundation of science by understanding a little bit more each day. We're just pushing the envelope of human knowledge a little bit further each day. So there aren't a lot of like epiphany moments involved in this type of experiment. But what is interesting and personally fulfilling to me is there, there are times when you are pushing that envelope, when you're, when you're pushing the boundaries of human knowledge that you have this incredibly rare opportunity to know something about the universe that no one else in the world knows. No one in the history of mankind has ever known. There's this nugget of knowledge about how the universe actually exists 
and you're the first and only person to know it for a brief period until you share that information. And it's, it's both humbling and empowering to, to have that moment where you realize that I have a bit of knowledge no one else has about the universe in which we live. And that is thrilling. That is exciting. Even if the bit of knowledge isn't all that, you know, big, even if it's not this big epiphanous moment, it is exciting to be in that situation. Did I answer the question? Uh, that's uh, yes, <laughs> that's, that's what I've gotten did. from it. I don't know if that's what I've learned so much, uh, but uh, that's definitely what I've gotten from it. That's something that's deeply personally fulfilling for me. Yes, that's an excellent answer. Uh, thank you. You zoomed through over 20 questions. Thank you, audience, for these fantastic questions. We're going to kick it back over to Jade at South Dakota School of Mines, and she will close us out. Hey, yeah, thanks, Mark. That was awesome. We certainly appreciate you taking the time to show us around Caspar and your evil Bond villain lair. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank our partners at Sanford Lab who helped with this uh, production. Matt Kappas, I think, is doing our excellent video work over there. Um, Aaron for fielding all of our questions and Connie for her assistance in setting this up as well. Um, if you missed part of the broadcast or you want to see it again, well, we, we will be posting the full video on our South Dakota Mines and Sanford Lab Facebook pages. So please make sure you're following both. Um, you can also find more underground experiences at Sanford Lab, including 3D virtual tours on their YouTube channel and more educational resources at their website at sanfordlab.org. Um, for more Engineers Week videos and interactive resources, you can go to the School of Minds website at sdsmt.edu. And uh, tomorrow, if you want to tune into our YouTube channel at 10 a.m., we will be doing the video premiere of our American Chemical Society's um, Chemistry Magic Show as kind of the, the grand finale for our Engineers Week activities. So again, uh, thank you, Mark, and the crew over at Sanford, and thank you to everyone for joining us, and happy Engineers Week, everybody. <laughs>